This is Mises Weekends with your host, Jeff Dice. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to Mises Weekends. We are joined, I think, for the third time by one of our favorite guests, Patrick Barron. Um, we're talking about interest rates and what's going on in Europe with so-called negative interest rates. Before we get into that, let me ask you something. Janet Yellen announced earlier this month that for only, I guess, the second time since 2006, the Fed would raise interest rates by a quarter point. I think it's somewhat laughable that the whole world is waiting with bated breath for these tiny little interest rate hikes. But give me your thoughts on Yellen's uh, announcement. And uh, do you think, given the level of federal government debt, that they can aggressively raise rates over the next few years? Well, I, I don't think that they can aggressively raise rates. Um, now, whether they're forced to do that, that may be the case. And whether rates themselves just go up and the Fed has no control over it may also be the case. I, don't, I think they want to hold down interest rates. And the uh, raise of a very modest announced one quarter of a percent does send a signal to the world that um, we may be getting to the end of this uh, massive intervention, or at least, you know, it isn't going to go on much longer. You know, it's not going to keep going down and down. So I think it also, uh, the increase in of the uh, rate of one quarter percent that Yellen announced is going to put pressure on the European Central Bank to end its negative interest rate uh, scenario or its policies. And uh, that's really what I'd like to talk about is that um, what is the thing that is being called a negative interest rate? And uh, like a lot of things that we hear from the mainstream press and out of the Keynesian's mouth, it's, uh, I just call it a misuse of language. It is not an interest rate. And I think they do that for the same reason that they call, that we now call status policies, liberal policies, is because they want to take one of uh, liberalism's favorite terms and turn it around. And one of the favorite terms of uh, at real economics is the interest rate. Well, and then we look at an interest rate as being a, a thing that is vastly important to the, to the economy. Uh, the interest rate has to be uh, not manipulated. But by calling something a negative interest rate, it kind of gives the aura that, oh, look, it's really an interest rate. You know, it just happens to be negative. And uh, this really isn't the case. Sure. What? What? If they're not really interest rates, what? What are negative interest rates, and what purpose do they serve the ECB or or central bankers? It's hard. To, it's hard to imagine what purpose they're serving, <laughs> except hmm. the continuation of a Keynesian mindset. But what it is is really just a service charge. It's really that the central banks have uh, decided that. They're going to charge. It's a charge on bank reserves. So the ECB is a little different than the Fed, of course, because the customers that the European Central Bank deals with are not the actual uh, banks directly. They are the the national central banks of of their members. So they deal with the the Bank of France and the uh, Bundesbank, for example, and the the central bank in, in Greece. But what, so what the ECB does is they, the euro reserves that are kept by these national central banks at the ECB, the ECB is charging a, a, as a service charge. And currently it's four tenths of 1%. So uh, a while back, I looked this up. It, it doesn't change. This doesn't change very often. But I looked up um, what are the euros that are kept as reserves by the Bundesbank at the European Central Bank. Now, the Bundesbank keeps most of the reserves in the entire system uh, at the European Central Bank, and it's around 675 billion euros. So at four-tenths of 1%, that means that the ECB is charging the uh, German banking system 2.7 billion euros a year. That's a charge. To the, to the German banking system. Well, that charge has got to be borne by somebody. And uh, I suppose the, year, the Bundesbank could eat the charge and charge that fee against its capital, but eventually it's going to have, it has been 
deciding it's just going to have to pass that charge along to its customers, who are the large German banks uh, that we've heard of. So that's what's been called a, a negative interest rate, and it's really nothing of the kind. It's just a charge that the European Central Bank is charging the national central banks and they are in turn uh, charging their own customers. Now, so what do the uh, the Deutsche Banks, for example, what does it do? So it gets charged by the Bundesbank, the Central Bank of Germany, so many millions of euros. Well, they have to either eat that charge, which they can do for a while, I suppose, but eventually they have to decide to charge their own customers for this. And this is where you start to say, well, what is the purpose of all this and how can it possibly work? And I'm just saying it it isn't working. Um, So they are now charging their deposit customers because it is a deposit charge. They're passing that along to their largest deposit customers. But this has caused a, a backlash and it has had consequences. The immediate consequence was that these large depositors sought to pull their funds out of the banks because if they're going to be uh, charged four-tenths of 1% for money that they just have sitting in a checking account, well, this is costing them a lot of money. So they say, well, what can we do with the money? Maybe we can just invest it in something that's very safe. So they started investing it in very safe sovereign bonds, uh, German sovereign bonds, or bonds of very safe corporations. And this is where the supposed interest rate went to a negative um, amount. But all it really meant was for a period of time, these large depositors' money were, was, were trapped in the banking system and they had to get it out. And they really, the only way they could get that money out was to invest it in something else. So they decide they're going to buy, you know, a, a triple A stock and that stock start or triple A bond. So that bond price started getting bid up close to 100. And then it went over 100 because the, the, these customer deposit customers saw that a small loss is preferable to a bigger loss. So that's how it got to be negative. So it looked like, well, how, you know, there, some of these bonds were actually trading at um, above par for a brand new bond, that sounds like a contradiction in logic. Well, it's not really a contradiction in logic. It really just means that for a temporary period of time, these depositors had to figure out how they were gonna get their money out of the banks and then store it someplace that they would not actually lose much money. So what they've been doing is some of these large depositors have actually been pulling their money out and trying to get cash for their money. Now, it's not easy to do, but they are getting actual paper notes and they're starting to store these wherever they can find adequate storage facilities. Some, I understand, some are actually building large storage facilities. So this is what I think, why I think it's a temporary phenomenon in that it's, it's a logical thing from the Keynesian mindset of keep driving down the interest rate close to zero and then, well, gee, let's drive it into a negative position. How do you do that? Well, you start charging for, for reserves. But this has had a backlash where we might actually see an actual run on banks where depositors come in and just say, give me the cash. I want my cash now. And the banks aren't going to have the actual physical cash. So this is going to create some kind of crisis. And then from a practical standpoint, it really just isn't working because the Keynesians really wanted the banks to increase their lending, but they haven't been increasing their lending because this is really a tax on the banking system. So they've had to pass these charges along to their customers in some form. So it just plain hasn't worked. And I think for that reason and the fact that the Fed is starting to get its interest rate up, which is causing pressure it's uh, on the uh, the fact that the the euro is trading against the dollar at one of its lowest rates ever meaning that imports are costing the Europeans much more uh, all these things are going to point that I in my my opinion the European Central Bank and some of the other central banks uh, such as the Bank of Japan Switzerland Denmark Sweden 
who all have negative interest rates, are eventually going to be abandoning these. It's just a, a bad idea. But of course, the the drive behind all this, at least ostensibly, if you if you spoke to a European central bank, would be, well, we have to push the banks to push their excess cash into the economy. It's all driven by this mania that we have to create demand uh, by any right. means necessary. So, it, But it doesn't sound like it's doing that because there's still something called human nature, which wants to put away for a rainy day. And there's still something called human nature that worries about uncertainty. And so you get people literally doing what we would call proper warehousing of cash money, at least it sounds like. Right. That's what I say. That's what I would really call a run on a bank. You know, I want I want my cash and I'm going to stick it under my mattress, you know, or in a vault someplace. So, yeah, it's all the Keynesian mindset of aggregate demand is what really drives the economy, which is absolute nonsense. Uh, savings drives the economy. And that's and it's really savings that um, is the main contributor to the interest rate. And the interest rates are always positive. It's an, it's illogical that an interest rate can be negative. Talk some more about that, though, for people who who may not understand that you and I would view that as an as axiomatic, but this idea that we always prefer present goods over future goods, and thus the the real or natural rate of interest is ever and always positive. Uh, elaborate on that. Well, I gave a, I gave a short talk to a business group in Wilmington, Delaware, uh, a couple of weeks ago about this, and I started out saying. Okay, if we all hear that interest rates are negative, many of us would say, oh, does that mean that I can borrow $100,000 from my bank, and when I have to pay it back, the bank will say I only have to pay back $98,000. Gee, I, I'll take that. Uh, give me the $100,000. I'll put 98000 under my mattress, and I've got $2,000 to spend. In fact, I'll borrow $100 million if you'll lend it to me, <laughs> you know, and uh so most people think that that is what the uh, negative interest rate is. But an interest rate is really based upon the fact that some people have uh, want to save money and some people want to borrow money. It, Mises called this, the Austrians called this time preference. It's an interesting concept, but it means that, for example, many of us, uh, when we're younger, we have a demand for money now that we don't have and I think most of our audience could understand that uh, the number one need that most of us when we're younger have for money that we don't have is to buy a house. Now, if we had to save to buy a house for full value, it would be we would not be able to buy a house perhaps until we're late middle age, maybe, where we'd have to be scrimping and saving because in the meantime, we'd have to pay rent to somebody and it'd be a long time before we could actually buy our house. So we have a need for money. Other people have want to save their money. So the savers and the the borrowers come together and the savers say, well, I'll lend you the money now, but the only only way I will possibly lend it to you now rather than just keep it under my mattress is if you promise to pay me back something higher than that in the future. So we all kind of come together in this marketplace, and that's what creates the uh, the interest rate is there is a pool of savings and there is demand for savings. This is in constant flux. So there really is never any just one interest rate. The interest rates are always in flux. There is sort of a, a natural interest rate based upon if people are saving a lot of money, then uh, the interest rate, there's going to be a bigger pool of funds available. So people are going to accept a smaller and smaller interest in the future that they get back. Um, if people don't want to save much money because you know there's a big demand for housing, and this is what happened with the baby boom generation. One of the reasons that the interest rate went very high in the, in the 70s and 80s was because the baby boom generation were borrowing lots of money for houses, in addition to the fact that the Fed was printing money. <laughs> but so that added on to it the the interest rate really has many components to it. And of course, uh, one of the components is the risk. You know, you may be a better risk than I am. So therefore, someone may lend money to you at a lot slightly lower rate than they'll lend it to me because I'm a higher risk. And there's also the risk that by the time we get around to actually paying the money back, there is a risk that the purchasing power of that money will have fallen. So all of this kind of gets bid into the into the free market 
uh, into the marketplace for the interest rate. But the interest rate can never be negative in that somehow I'm going to take my, I'm a, if I'm a saver, I'm going to take my $100 and uh, I'm going to give it to you, but you only have to pay me back 99 Just think about that. That doesn't make any sense to me as a saver. No, I'll just keep my $100 in my wallet. Thank you very much. Um, so it's just a contradiction in terms and um, like I say, it's like a lot of things that happen in modern the modern uh, financial press. These terms start to get uh, accepted, and no one really questions on well, what do these things really mean? So this is why you know there is no there really is no such thing as a negative interest rate. What's interesting to me, Patrick, is that if banks were were literally warehousing physical cash and safeguarding it for you, you might indeed pay them a fee to have that physical cash held at someplace safer than your house or under your mattress. But that's not what they're doing. This is just digital currency made up of, of blips. And in fact, if you want to go buy a used car that you found on Craigslist for $10,000 and you go to your local branch um, and ask them for $10,000 cash, they may not even have that much in, in the branch. So it's it's a fascinating time. Let me ask you this. Given this this six month now, eight month experiment from the ECB with negative interest rates and given such low interest rates around the world and the economic instability causing a flight to safety, isn't all this at least in the short term good for US Treasury jet? Why are why are we struggling at Treasury auctions to find buyers other than the Fed? Uh, because from my perspective, uh, uh, U.S. Treasury debt looks like the the least dirty shirt in the laundry right now. Yeah, you know, in the in the land of the blind, the one eyed man is king. You know, I think uh, yeah, you know, fortunately for all of us Americans, uh, the dollar is still the least worthless currency out there. You know, I mean, it seems like every central bank in the world is trying their darndest to destroy their currency. At least in the near future, for some period of time, people are going to be looking to the dollar as, well, the dollar is probably still the least uh, bad currency. But uh, eventually, uh, this all has to stop. And I think, you know, I just listened uh, this week to an interview that you yourself did with John Williams from Shadow Stats a while back. And uh, John, you know, made the point that um, the only real buyer of U.S. Treasury debt now is the Fed itself that most of these big central banks like Japan and China, the Netherlands, um, or the European Central Bank and some of the other uh, central banks in the world are actually not buying U.S. treasuries. They're not investing in in U.S. debt because they've got more than enough dollars, more dollars than they really want, and they're starting to get worried. So this means that the Fed is just adding, is just monetizing the debt. Now, Again, for a while, this kind of goes on, but eventually people start worrying about it. And um, as John Williams said, this really, folks, this cannot go on forever, that we can just keep printing money and pretending as if everything is fine. There is a reality out there that uh, the medium of exchange just has to have some sort of means to it. And the federal government, by just issuing debt that the Fed itself monetizes is not really a means of providing for that debt. It's just paper. And this is how, uh, this is how central banks eventually fail. And uh, I think the central bank that is probably, you know, most likely to fail in the near future, in my humble opinion, is the European Central Bank, because it is composed of sovereign nations who can decide just to get the heck out. And when they do that, there's nothing that's going to stop them. Whereas Americans, you know, we are ruled by the almighty Fed, and we can't get rid of our central bank without an act of Congress. But the French and the Germans and the Italians and, and the Spanish, they can decide just to leave the European system if they want. I think especially if one of the large economies – such as uh, France, Italy, or Germany, or Spain decided to get rid of the euro and reinstitute their own currency, then it's all over for the European Central Bank. And then we would find out that the ECB, as a fiat currency, uh, is really not even worth the paper that it's printed on. Well, Pat, we're 
about out of time. I'll leave you with one last question. Give us your prediction in 2017. Will the Fed be able to go an entire year weaning itself off of QE, or it, will it be forced to once again, as John Williams suggests, uh, to engage in further rounds of bond buying or worse from commercial banks to, to sort of keep this whole thing propped up? Well, I think it all depends upon, you know, John was, I think, the third person I'd heard say this in the last couple of weeks, that um, price, retail price inflation, consumer price inflation is likely to take off in 2017. If that does happen, then I don't really see that the Fed would have any choice but to raise rates, because I think the public is going to demand that uh, it just cannot stand another round of price inflation like we had in the in the 70s and and 80s that that's just got to stop so i think that that is what's likely to happen now if they can paper over that or as john says they use their statistics to fool us that um, prices really aren't going up folks you're you're just mistaken you know the price of beef really didn't rise and uh, you weren't really forced to buy hamburger If they can still fool us, then they might be able to continue this for a while longer. But eventually, I think the retail prices are going to start to rise. And before they can really get out of hand, the Fed is going to have to start raising rates. Now, this is going to cause a recession. And a recession in the United States, as we Austrians know, is really nothing more than a correction, a necessary and inevitable correction to the, the fact that the structure of production in the American economy is in dislocation. And uh, while it is getting back in equilibrium, there is going to be a certain amount of uh, joblessness and business failures. But that is just really a recognition of reality. So all of this kind of gets tied together into Austrian economics. And um, the interest rate is a part of it, but it's a critical part of it. And I do think that... Uh, that if prices start to take off, as John does predict, I think the Fed is going to be forced to start inching the interest rate up a little bit more at a time throughout the year. Well, it's going to be a fascinating 2017 for monetary policy. We're going to have several hundred vacancies at the Fed fillable by the Trump administration. It's also going to be interesting to see whether Trump and his administration have a combative relationship with Janet Yellen and company. Pat Barron, thanks so much for your time. And ladies and gentlemen, have a great weekend. Subscribe to Mises Weekends via iTunes U, Stitcher, and SoundCloud, or listen on Mises.org and YouTube.